If it goes right, it's a slice. If it goes left, it's a hook. If it goes straight, it's a miracle. This is Out of Bounds. If it's happening in the world of golf, we're talking about it. Coverage, debate, discussion, pro golf and local golf. Let's do it. This is Out of Bounds. And here are your hosts, Nate Sharman and Josh Durso. All right, welcome back to the Out of Bounds podcast. Josh Durso and Nate Sharman here getting you caught up after a very busy week in the golf world. Nate, I went into last week thinking Tiger playing in the hero was going to be the biggest story in golf by the time the dust settled on Sunday. Boy, was I wrong. Holy cow, what a week. Wow, yes. In a week where the big cat makes his first return, his first full tournament, right, since you know, the beginning of the year when he tried to play in the Masters. But he gets all the way around for 72 with the hero in the Bahamas. But yes, you're right, Josh. That's hardly the number one story here uh, as we get going today. And of course, that big story is uh, rolling the golf ball back. The USGA and RNA are expected to announce a rollback of the golf ball this week. Change is aimed at reducing distance by 10 to 15 percent and comes after major pushback to bifurcation rollout uh, could begin as soon as 2026. Uh, but we've also seen 2028, 2030, uh, a couple other years tossed around. Biggest criticism so far has come from advocates of the amateur game uh, where distance obviously is not an issue. Uh, Nate, you and I aren't uh, driving the ball 340 yards. Uh, but what's your reaction to uh, the news itself uh, rolling the golf ball back first, I guess, at the professional level? At a professional level, Josh, I'm a proponent. Um, I've sat here on this podcast and talked about how I think it's a good thing for the professional game for a while now. Um, yeah. Basically, we're at a point in golf where we're you know, having some golf courses that are unusable, whether it be Pine Valley or some other different golf courses that you know, you have a guy like Roy McIlroy or, or Bryson DeChambeau or anybody of that nature that hits the ball far we saw it back in 2020 where Bryson played that bomb and gouge at wing foot and won the, won the U.S. Open. So maybe maybe rolling that golf ball back can be a good thing for the professional game, you know, making it so just guys can work on other parts of their game and other parts of their game can shine a little more. That's kind of what Rory said a little bit on Axe the last few days, too. And I kind of agree with that. I think that's kind of a good idea to do in the professional game. Uh, add some bifurcation to the, to the golf course. You know, all, all these other sports do it, baseball, football, all these other sports do it. You, you play the, maybe play the same game as the pros, but you don't at the end of the day. Um, I don't know if I like how they did it with implementation. I think they could have done a little bit better, maybe by not bringing the golf ball back, but maybe continuing to bifurcate, by, bifurcate um, golf clubs, I think would be a good idea. I know they already do that, but even do that further. And then maybe this goes a little bit under the mat. And we don't even really talk about it that much, but since it's the golf ball and people can relate to it a lot more, I think this is a huge story. And obviously it is. And, but I, but I think at the end of the day, it, it's a good thing for professional golf and it will be a better product because of it. Uh, Josh, what do you think? I, you know what? I I've said it before on the show. I'll say it again. I don't like it at the pro level. I think it makes golf a more boring product, especially when we're talking about a product that people uh, need to sit down and watch for hours at a time. Uh, on television if they really want to uh, consume it the way that the the tour wants uh, consumers to consume it. Um, I look at the MLB and the NFL. Yeah, uh, you know, baseball became incredibly popular in the 90s and 2000s because of the long ball, the power game, offense. Um, you know, shortly after that, they prioritize uh, skill and, you know, the game suffers, popularity suffers. The NFL had to make changes to the game over the last decade because of player safety. Uh, there have been complaints, yes, but they made adjustments that prioritized offense. And I think the difference is that the PGA Tour is basically going down the MLB road and not the NFL road. So they're letting the the purists sort of dictate what's right for the game and not uh, the consumer. I think if, if there's less scoring, if there's less offense, if there's less birdies, fewer people will ultimately watch. And you can say, well, you know, skill can lead to, you know, uh, skill can lead to offense and and scoring and all those things too. Well, yeah, but you know when you think back to the Tiger era, what do people remember most about Tiger's victories or remember the most of his victories? They're the big ones. They're the ones where he absolutely dominated, where he crushed, um, and where he really stood out because he was playing a long game that no one else was playing. So I don't know. I I don't like it at the professional level. Um, I think golf is gaining popularity. I think that you know. Evidence tells us that 
you know, uh, from a television rating standpoint, the PGA Tour is trending in the wrong direction. And I don't think making the golf ball shorter, making these guys shorter off the tee is going to necessarily help that. Yeah, Josh, I think you're 100% correct. And I like that. I like that comparison to what the NFL has done the last few years. We've seen so much more, you know, defensive penalties, including you know, roughing the passers, been able to move offenses a little bit, you know, closer and generate more points, right, over the last few years. But I think one thing too to to t- kind of tack on to your to your point there is, you know, we have this whole chicks dig the long ball, right? We talk about that in golf. That's always been something that's been a fun kind of moniker, right? And another thing too is the PGA Tour likes to market big hitters. You go on the PGA Tour's, you know, Twitter, formerly or formerly known as Twitter now X, you go on their timeline during a, a big tournament and you'll see, oh, Dustin Johnson just hit this ball 346 yards. Rory McIlroy just hit it by everybody 380 yards. Heck, last week at the Hero, Tiger hit it. I can't remember what hole it was. It was either Thursday or Friday. Tiger hit this ball way further than everybody, which is a story beyond itself, right? And they tweeted out a picture of where everyone's where the spray chart is, and then Tiger's ball was way in front of it. So it's like they they like to promote this, and they should promote the long ball, but we're gonna have less of it. So yeah, you're you're 100 right. At the end of the day, I think it's you're gonna lose some casual viewers just because they're not. You know, they're not driving 330 yard greens. They're not putting themselves in, in spots for eagles on short par fours, which is really fun about the professional game of golf. One other thing on that front. Um, if this is the most creative solution, the greatest minds in golf could come up with to make legacy stops on the PGA Tour and in majors playable for the Rory's, the modern pro or where the, the professional game is going, then we're in trouble. Right. Yeah. Like if this is the most creative thing they could come up with, then we're really in a tough spot. And what's funny is that the this is most golfers don't like this. Keegan Bradley says it said it's an abomination abomination earlier at the hero about it. But Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods love it. So it doesn't matter how everyone like everyone thinks about it. Right. If Tiger loves it, if Rory loves it, we're doing it. Yep. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about the. implications for the common man. I think way more important here is that. Yes, uh, what do you make of this ruling? Obviously, bifurcation is not happening. So right. we are going by route of uh, a rolled back golf ball for everyone. Your initial uh, reaction to that. Obviously, we don't we don't know all of the specifics of how this is going to actually look in real life implement, implementation. But assuming we're talking about a 5 to 15% reduction uh, significantly rolled back golf ball. What do you think this does to the amateur game? Yeah. So first of all, this isn't going to affect your league next year. This isn't going to come in probably until about 2030. So don't worry too much about it, but still have it in the back of your mind. Um, it, it does kind of, it is kind of weird to me, Josh, that they would bifurcate the, bifurcate the golf ball for the the common man, as you said, why make golf harder? Golf's already as hard as it can be. I think, you know, we can do other things, whether it be move up a tee box to our correct spot or something like that to kind of offset that instead of instead of kind of nerfing the golf ball. Right. But one thing I kind of have thought about it a little bit more over the last few days. And I just think, Josh, that, you know, at the common man golf course where people are playing for fun and not, you know, they might care about their score. Right, Josh, but they don't it's not going to make or break their day. If they shoot 86 or 88 or 92, it's not going to, you know, it doesn't change their life, I guess. I, I just don't think they'll do it. I don't think you'll see golfers playing, you know, where they're playing against their buddies for a couple dollars or a beer or something like that. They're not going to play these rolled back golf balls. You know, I don't think there's any way to make them play these rolled back golf balls. I think what you'll see in pro shops in 2030 is you'll see these third market brands selling golf balls that aren't rolled back. I think you might go to the point where you don't see as many Titleist, Bridgestone or these name brand golf balls in pro shops in the next 10 years when this rollback sort of starts to happen. You're going to see more startup golf ball opportunities that come in these pro shops and stuff. And there's going to be a lot more market share for these kind of lower golf ball entities in my mind. So I think that's one thing you're going to see. But at the end of the day, for me, it's just why make golf harder, Josh? It's already pretty pretty darn hard. Yeah, I, I think, you know, some of the things I was reading, you know, we saw, I believe it was Michael Breed who, who tweeted out the uh, the comparison of the 1995 uh, Titleist professional golf ball that doesn't pass the new yeah. specification. 1995. If we're going that far back, I, I've heard, you know, Rory says it's only going to be five or ten yards. Um, I tell you what, if we're going back to a golf ball that's three decades plus old, it's it's more than 
five or 10 yards because the, the average golfer has picked up more than five or 10 yards uh, yes. since 1995. So there don't, don't say that. That just sounds disingenuous. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, I personally, I think I'm hoping for the USGA and the RNA to try and force a quick rollout because I think that's how it gets sabotaged at the, at yeah. the amateur level. Um, if they roll, if they slow roll this thing and it's 28 or 30, I think you'll see a scenario where, um, or you could see a scenario where they're just, there are only, uh, nerfed golf balls on the market. Those are the only ones being sold. You know, like I, I, the optimistic part of my brain wants to be in that camp with you where, you know, pro shops are going to, are going to sell, uh, unregulated illegal golf balls. But I think, I, the the pessimist in me just doesn't think that the average person running a the average business owner running a golf course I, I don't know that they have the the time or the wherewithal to reinvent their whole process of of where they're getting stuff where they're sourcing things and you know can those smaller companies make a go of it in that market um, you know yeah. I, you know if it's forced over a very short amount of time I think it's a a scenario where we could see just push back to a point of consumers not being interested at all. Um, but if it's slow rolled, then I think you may just see a, a trench, a trend switch. And probably the most concerning part of that, you know, you and I have both worked in the, the golf business. Um, you know, one, I think of play slowing down and two, I think of interest uh, slowly over a span of years uh, waning in playing golf. If all of a sudden someone who picked up the game during the pandemic or maybe right around the pandemic uh, was hitting the ball 185 or 190 yards, and now they're only hitting the ball 150 or 160 yards. Right. That's that's going to be like, I, I know it sounds dramatic to say, but like, I don't think that it's just going to be a 10 or 15% reduction if it's the kind of change that we're seeing outlined by the stakeholders that are involved in this thing. So, you know, I don't, I, it, to me, unnecessary, like you said, but also just uh, bad for the game in a lot of different ways on the the hacker side of things. Yeah, I agree, Josh. And, and I think if I own a, if I own a public golf course or I run a municipal golf course, this is kind of, this is kind of angered to me, this whole ruling, because golf has gained so much momentum through COVID, kind of like how you said, you know, for people picking up the game you know, due to being at home and stuff like that. Golf has exploded over the last five years. Right. Yeah. And that's something we've talked about here on this podcast a ton. And you can, you can argue that a lot of people at these public or municipal courses playing golf, a lot of new golfers, I should say, I don't want to put anyone in a box are out there because, you know, they might hit it 230 yards consistently, but every once in a while they hit one, they hit one and it goes 270 yards. And that's just the coolest feeling ever. Right. Josh, when you get out, on the middle of the fairway and you look back at the tee box and you might get your range finder out and gun the tee box, see how far you hit it. And that's just awesome. That, that, that is almost, you know, we talk about so much how maybe a birdie brings you back, but I think for a lot of golfers, the fact that they might just blitz one tee shot brings them back and has them play another day, you know, they can look over to their buddy and say, and, you know, make the, have you seen that new super Walmart joke they built or something like that? You know, and I think that makes golf fun. So I think at the end of the day, you know, nerfing the golf off for amateurs, is bad definitely, but I just don't think I don't think they'll be able to implement it. I really I don't think they'll be able to force everyone to use a regulated golf ball that's just playing you know nine holes or eighteen holes of golf on a Saturday morning with their buddies or with their the group of people that they play with. I so I don't think yeah. it's gonna be a huge story. I don't I don't think they'll be able to do that. Yeah, I, 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 see, I, I guess. hope they can't. We'll see what uh, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, next up, we've got a couple Tiger stories of note. First, uh, Tiger, obviously, as we said earlier, finished uh, the hero without any noticeable issues. Didn't have a limp. His ball speed was solid, and he seemed to be hitting the golf ball well. Uh, he looks a lot different, uh, but signs point to him playing the PNC, and maybe this this uh, 12 tournaments a year uh, forecast that he laid out uh, in his presser last week, maybe maybe that's realistic. What did you take away from him uh, playing this past weekend? I think it's the best possible way it could have gone for Tiger this week. I think, you know, there was no, no, like you said, no noticeable limp, no noticeable injuries or anything like that. He played okay. He shot even par, finished towards the, the bottom, uh, but did beat a few players. But um, I, I think this is definitely a very good sign for Tiger. And I think coming back in this tournament was, was the right move for him because he could play in this tournament and not have to face a cut 
or to worry about finishing anywhere. You could finish kind of anywhere in this tournament. You know, this 20, 20 person kind of hit and giggle that happened in the Bahamas, you know, isn't a real like PGA top turn. I know it really is, but it, at the end of the day, it isn't in my mind. And we're going to see a lot more of it on the PGA tour. That's a whole nother discussion. But um, I think it was, it was really good for Tiger. We saw, we had some Tiger moments too, right? You know, on Friday, he knocks in this 30 plus footer for birdie. And, you know, you have me who's here working from home and I'm not even a, a, a huge Tiger fan per se. And I got a little fired up because of it. You know, you know, knocks in this 35 footer and that's just cool. Right. So, and then you, you see a tough up and down. I believe it was either Saturday or maybe it was, I think it was Saturday and it's tough up and down to a tight pin out of a bunker. And he, he knocks it up to 10 feet and rolls it in. So he has some of these, these tiger moments, right? I already mentioned how he hit it further than everybody on Thursday and one of the tees. So I think it's, it's just great to have him back at the end of the day. Um, I think this is a really positive step in this 12, 12 tournament a year for many laid out. I still don't think he plays that many. I think it's right around that eight to 10 number that he winds up playing in 2024. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, my only takeaway from this past week, and I guess I didn't really realize it until probably about Sunday, um, he's physically gigantic. Yes. And uh, he is much he bigger. He wore shorts in and a, and a, and a, uh, a cutoff t-shirt on Sunday. Maybe that's when you noticed? Pretty, yeah, pretty... I mean, there were there were also a couple photos that I think were just the contrast was jacked up in them. So you could really see like his arms and his shoulders and his chest are huge. Um, obviously he's spending a lot of time in the gym and obviously he's compensating for, uh, he's added strength in his upper body to compensate for the strength that he's lost in his lower body. Right. Um, you know, the, the gym rat in me says that usually comes with consequences, um, especially at his age, especially at that level. Um, I'm curious to see how he fares in the, I'll call it medium term. Looks good now. He might look good in January and February and March, but how does his upper body um, survive the wear and tear of a PGA Tour season if he is going to play, say, eight to 12 tournaments in 2024? How How is his upper body holding up in August? Um, in yeah. September, if he makes the if he makes the playoffs, because conceivably, if he's playing 12 tournaments and he's playing well, he could make the FedEx Cup playoffs. So, you know, I, I guess... It's a wait and see, but that's the thing that I'm waiting to see. I don't know, you know, I don't feel like we saw enough from his game, and I don't really think I'm going to see anything in the PNC that's going to make me say, "Oh yeah, his game is back." Like he he can go win a golf tournament. I'm still not I'm still not in that camp. Um, I want to see him play a couple real tournaments, maybe in January or February, uh, before we we start to make that uh, make any kind of assumptions uh, about that. But yeah, the PNC is next week, I believe. And I'm I'm more excited to watch Charlie Woods and Tiger, to be honest. Um, I, I really like that tournament. I think it's a lot of fun to watch. You know, you have the Coochers that play together, uh, the dailies that play together in the past. I think it's a really fun tournament too, but all eyes will be on on the Woods family in that one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we got another Tiger related story. TW Legion reported on X this week that the PNC might actually be the last event we see Tiger wearing Nike. Uh, he reportedly signed a 10 year deal in 2013, and there's been some rumblings about another company taking over Nike's apparel line. Uh, we also heard from some reporting online that TW apparel is not appearing or included in the 2024 Nike catalog, uh, of note there. Uh, I mentioned the 10 year deal tiger didn't sign a lifetime deal like LeBron James has with Nike. So that's that. Um, what do you make of it? Big deal, not a big deal. What are your thoughts there, Nate? It's definitely something to think about. I wouldn't put it in the big deal category just yet for me, but it is going to be strange if we see Tiger playing, like we just talked about, 10 to 12 events in 2024, and he doesn't have that swoosh on because that's all we're used to, right? And um, that's a big loss for for uh, for Nike. And you would you would fair to assume if they do lose Tiger Woods for something like this, then their golf apparel brand is kind of you know to the wayside, which would be kind of surprising to me because it just from – you know, just from looking around at different golf courses, it seems like Nike golf has always ruled and will continue to rule as long as they have Tiger Woods. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of things that I saw online that I think stand out to me, uh, you know, uh, TaylorMade and Adidas used to be synonymous with one another. Uh, we've heard TaylorMade uh, coming up as a potential uh, buyer for Nike's apparel line. Don't necessarily know if uh, that's the direction this is going to go. Um, I think it would be a big deal to kind of like the people who look at the the legacy, because I think 
when you talk about uh, Tiger Woods and Nike Golf, or just Nike in general, um, they put him in the same category as most people put him in the same category as LeBron um, or a Jordan or someone like that, who basically like is the reason, or at least part of the reason why uh, Nike is what it is from a brand perspective present day. Um, but, you know, also I look at a lot of TW stuff from the last, uh, you know, if you look at stuff from the TW collection in the last, I say like five years, five, six, seven years, even, um, it's gotten a lot less, uh, a lot less in your face and the branding has really like stepped back on it. And to, to this point, um, Nike just, I believe this past week or in the next week or so, uh, they're relaunching the TW 13s, uh, master editions, uh, golf shoes, which was, uh, Tiger's most popular golf shoe ever. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to what's what's happened here. Like, you know, the brand, the TW uh, Nike golf brand hasn't really innovated the way it did between the late 90s and, you know, early 20 teens. And because of that, I think Nike's probably maybe it's because of Nike or maybe it's because of Tiger or maybe it's just because, you know, Nike and Tiger aren't as or haven't been as into uh, trying to innovate on that front as they were in the first you know, part of his career, but I be thinking about that. I would understand why they'd want to part ways now, if that's the case. Yeah. And I, mean, I still think we see the TW logo. Story. It's a, yeah, definitely. I'll keep going with the TW logo. I would think uh, just the Nike story is huge. We have seen him wear foot joint shoes the last few years since the accident. So that's something, all other, other things to point out, but you know, by the time we put all these points together, Josh, it feels like something about Nike golf apparel could be coming to an end, but we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely interesting. I mean, does does Nike apparel cease to so if this like sales situation happens, does Nike apparel cease to exist? And does TW not become a collection within a brand, but become the brand itself? Yeah, maybe Tiger goes, he takes his TW and he and he goes to a different manufacturer, right? And sort of outsources it to an to an extent a little bit. Um, but yeah, probably I, I would think so. You know, if, if Nike golf loses a guy like Tiger Woods, it's over for Nike golf, I would think. Yeah. Or if, you know, the, to put flip the shoe a little bit, if Nike no longer wants Tiger, um, maybe they just don't see the upside to it at this point. And, you know, that's entirely possible. Um, let's see. One uh, hero related headline. <laughs> excuse me. One hero related headline uh, got a lot of attention. Colin Morikawa was assessed a two stroke penalty during the third round, apparently stemmed from information that uh, was gained through a measuring device on the practice green, which was then written down in Collins' green book and used during the round. Uh, the rule apparently states that you can do that, as in use a measuring device, not really clear what that was, uh, on a practice green, but you have to store it in your brain. You can't store it in a book. If you write it down, that's that's where you're violating the rules. Uh, Matt Fitzpatrick was the one who questioned uh, the move, which prompted the investigation, the rules investigation on site. I believe we learned Sunday morning that he was being assessed a two-stroke penalty from the day prior. I don't know, what do you what do you think? It didn't seem to me like it was malicious. And I think if we have these like murky gray area rules, the tour really needs to like clarify and clean these things up because it's a bad look for everybody involved. If you have one of the best golfers in the world getting hacked with a two stroke penalty the next day because of something that seems like a, a clerical error. Yeah. Weird. It's, it's hard to really, you know, state it just, just not being there and being able to sort of look at it. But the biggest thing for me, Josh, is with these elevated purses and with these, you know, 20 person events where the last person is getting paid, regardless of if they shoot 85 or, or what they do, I think this is, you're going to see this. It's going to be players are going to be more sticklers about the rules and, and governing other players, which is not something you've seen in golf. Uh, maybe ever, you know, golf has always been a game where you kind of govern yourself and rule yourself. But with purses being this high and two strokes mattering so much between winning uh, $500,000, maybe in a million dollars, or I'm just throwing numbers out here, but yeah. um, it's, it's, it's maybe a, a sort of quote unquote downside to elevating purses as much as you're going to see guys be really, really close and key and peel with how other players are using the rules. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see if we see more, you know, things come out of this, like more guys going at each other. Do does this create a rift between Matt Fitzpatrick and Colin Morikawa? Does this stem from the Ryder Cup? You know, on two guys on either side. 
I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think so. I think that's a way, way overreaction, but it, it's something to think about too. You know, it's just these purses being so big, guys are going to go at each other. It's just going to kind of happen now. You would think. Yeah. It, it just, to me, it feels weird because of the, the complication of the rule it just seems too. It seems like something that no one was really aware of. And by the way, from what I had seen uh, that night, um, Fitzpatrick didn't actually like call a rule per se. All okay. he did was inquire. He asked the rules official about the rule and kind of explained the situation. And it almost seemed like he was like maybe more inquiring for his own like purposes in the future. And the rules officials were basically like, oh, that's a that's a violation. Tell me more. And, you know, they go all in on it. I, to me, it just seems like a really weird thing again. Not to not to go back to this, but if we're talking about getting more people to watch golf, assigning yeah, penalties. Up if you didn't. <laughs> assigning penalties 24 hours after the thing happened is not a good way to increase viewership of professional golf. Plain and simple. Want to what is what you can agree, uh, do to uh, get more viewership on penalizing though? Penalize a slow play. If you just cross yeah. with two short penalties. I think yeah. that goes the inverse, right, Josh? Because it's finally going to set a precedent. But at the end of the day, yeah. for me, if you want to start penalizing guys for for using a protractor on the green, then you need to do it to everybody. If someone else does this real poorly, then you need to hit them with a two-stroke penalty, whether it be Scotty Scheffler, whether it be Tiger Woods or Rory McIlroy. I don't think – I think you need to either find a stance right now for the PGA Tour. Are we going to be sticklers on this and penalize every single time, or are we going to look turn our head the other way? Because I'm okay if we want to turn the head, turn our head the other way. But if we're coming down on a big tournament in July and we penalize a guy for something like this, then then that can't happen. But if we do it all the time, then it's okay. I just need consistency. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, okay, last topic here. We've got the Rom rumblings, which are continuing. Uh, we keep hearing that he's going to live. Uh, the most interesting tidbit here came last week at the Hero when Jordan Spieth uh, all but admitted that Rom is thinking about things. Uh, he said he didn't want to say any more out of respect for Rom and his family. Um, obviously, we've got the flushing it reporting that he's gone and it's done. Um, there are a few a uh, few uh, accounts on X have been tweeting over and over again that uh, Rom is gone. What do you what do you think? What do you make of it? We talked about it last week. I know there's not a ton to add here, but what do you what do you think now? It'd be very it's very strange where they've they've talked about Ron for so long and he hasn't really came out and said, what are you guys talking about? I mean, we saw this with some of the other players to a to a way lesser extent, a guy like Adrian Moronk, who is not even close to John Rom's status, where they've kind of telegraph and some other different ones have kind of said that maybe he's going to live. And then he comes out this morning and says on his Instagram about his PJ tour card, right? So that just kind of destroys that. But why hasn't Rom done that? We've seen Rom be on social media. Why hasn't he put that I'm not going to to to, to live or something like that? And the other thing too, Josh, that just came out is I believe they put out the field for the uh, AT and T in January, a tournament that he won last year, and I don't think he's in it. Uh -huh. um, that's big. That's big news um, because John, because we see these players like John Rom, who always play when they win an event, no matter what the event is, they seem to always play in that next year. We saw Max Homa play in the Fortnite, you know, the last few years after he's won that gone on that crazy run, a tournament that's in the fall that not a lot of people play in. We see guys come back and play in these events. So Josh, I've been steadfast in saying I don't think John Rahm's going a lot, going to going to live, excuse me. I'm starting to think maybe it's true. Um, they've been banging the drum that it's going to be announced this week. Here we sit on Wednesday morning at, you know, a little bit after or a little about closer to 930 Eastern time, and nothing's been announced yet. Um, knowing our look, Josh, uh, John Rahm will announce it at 10.30 Eastern time today. And this will be all for not. But um, I don't I still I'm, gonna, I'm still going to stay on the pack that I don't, I don't think he's going. But I am I used to be at like closer to 90 percent. I'm now towards 50 50 on if John Rahm's going to live. Yeah, I'm at the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm over it. He's going. I know he's going. Um, I, I don't see it any other way at this point. I think it's going to be a huge blow to the PGA Tour. Uh, it signals to me that a deal with the PIF isn't imminent. And the things that we heard Tiger and other guys saying last week maybe aren't the clearest picture of where things stand. I think the regulatory scrutiny that a deal between the tour and PIF would draw is the biggest thing holding up a deal between the two of them. I don't think the two sides are the problem at this point. I know there's 
Uh, you got Monahan uh, meeting this week with uh, Mr. PIF himself. Um, but I think this is more than a sports story, and we're heading into a presidential election cycle. And if you think uh, this thing can't become a major lightning rod for everybody involved, especially the the two people who end up vying for the White House next fall, uh, you're crazy. And I think that is probably the thing that's m- mucking things up so much right now for everybody involved. And I think a guy like Rom. Uh, especially after the last, uh, you know, six months and how contentious things have been, especially between the players, uh, the the player board, the policy board, uh, and the PGA Tour leadership. You know, I could see uh, Rom just saying, you know what, I'm not going to stick around to see how this all turns out. I've accomplished what I need to accomplish. I'll be able to play in as many majors as I want to play in. I'm going to take the money and go. Because guess what? If a deal doesn't get done, between the PIF and the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour, the PGA Tour is toast. I've said it before. I don't. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's true. Like I don't care what private investment, private equity investment you get that's American based. They will never be able to compete with the deepest pockets on planet Earth, which is the PIF and Saudi Arabia. So I just don't think that's a. I don't think that's a, a fair trade off and. I think this sets a uh, course for a really, really tough winter. If we're going to see the announcement this coming week, maybe later this week, that John Rahm is leaving the PGA Tour, I think it is a gigantic blow to the PGA Tour, and I'm not really sure what what that really means for the rest of uh, the 2024 season even, because you will now be able to say uh, two of the last four major winners are playing over over there in that other league that you've been trying to discredit now for two years. I just don't think it works. And we talk about, you know, the PIF and and the PGA Tour maybe coming to an agreement, whether it be this year or after the election cycle, like you pointed out, Josh. You know, John Rahm's got this upwards of 600 million, 500, maybe 550 million, something of that nature deal sitting on the table. All he's got to do is sign his name, right? At this point, you know, we've talked about how if he goes there and takes that money, he sets up his his family's generational family, family's family's family, family, all the way down the line, right? His family's set for eons. Yeah. And what we've learned about professional golf and what we know already about life in general, if you don't take the money, someone else will. There's always going to be someone that will do it. So maybe that's run through John Rahm. Wow, what a decision that's John Rahm's having to make. If should he go to live? Does he care about the getting to number one? That's which is something he can't accomplish over at Live, just not getting his enough points. Does OW drop points matter anymore? Does it matter to him? Does it matter to him? You know, lifetime. You know, as he's growing up to be the number one best golfer in the world, has that changed? I I, I don't envy John Rahm trying to make this decision because there is a lot of factors to it. But at the end of the day, six hundred million is a lot of money, and um, I think it's going to be hard to not to not take that if you're John Rahm. Yeah. And I'll say another thing here too. Um, I think if we're talking about who will be more lenient about letting uh, live players play in the PGA tour, it's the live side. You know, they're, they're spending all this money, not for exclusivity. They don't want these guys. They, they want their guys to be able to go play in PGA tour events. It's the PGA tour who's built up a wall and said, if you're a member of live, you're basically suspended indefinitely until you no longer have membership there. They're not spending 400, 500, 600 million dollars to get these guys and trap them in live. They're just spending that money just to get them to go play 12 or 14 or 16, whatever uh, events uh, in their team golf format. So like the, the calculus is completely different for live than it is for the PGA tour. And I think losing a guy like John Rahm really does a number on your credibility as being the uh, the tour that has truly the best golfers. Yes, yeah, you, you know, I, I, you and I were debating it a, a little bit earlier this week. You know, like there's a legit discussion now if Rahm goes to live, if you take the top five from live and the top five from uh, the PGA Tour, there's a legit conversation now that maybe the PGA Tour guys don't don't win that, you know, theoretical match yeah i mean i mean it, it's definitely true um Brooks Kepka, i think cam if, smith if Rom does go we need Rom. to see that match i need to see that match if golf's going to be fragmented like this where the best <laughs> best stars aren't playing each other on a, on a regular basis we need to see a match 
and they would have they would almost have to be unified at that point because if you have indefinite suspensions on the table you're never going to see that crossover match that is going to do it for this edition of out of bounds subscribe to the show on spotify or apple podcasts and follow us on tiktok uh, if you want to see more from us in between episodes for nate Sharman, i'm josh durso and remember whether it's down the middle or out of bounds keep on swinging you've been listening to out of bounds If it's coverage, debate, or discussion of pro and local golf, we'll be talking about it. Be sure to visit the website. Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. See you next time on Out of Bounds.